Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 12 today. I just love preparing, uh, studying the Word and preparing sermons and having the opportunity to preach every week. I'm in my 21st year right now of pastoral ministry and I, I just still love preaching and look forward to it and enjoy it. And it's always interesting how God speaks to us through His Word, even through passages that we might be familiar with. Um, it's just exciting to go through books of the Bible, and so I hope you get something out of, out of every message from, from the Word. Um, today we're going to be talking about, as you can tell, the music goes along with it, Am I Following Jesus? And there's, there's a lot more in here as well, but we see from Jesus how He lived with purpose and He lived to have an impact on other people and so what's been going on in Matthew was that at the end of chapter 3 that we looked at two weeks ago at the end of that chapter Jesus was baptized and it was sort of the the official beginning of his public ministry and then at the beginning of chapter 4 he's immediately faced with temptation and and he prepares himself for that by by fasting and by spending time alone with God the Father. And then the, these challenges come, these spiritual challenges, right after his baptism. And so at the end of last week, we looked at verse 11, where the angels came and ministered to him. He, he had a time of refreshing, of getting his strength back after all those trials. And so that's where we pick it up this week in verse 12. So let's read that together in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. It says, now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you look in your bulletin, you'll see some sermon notes. This is the first point here on these verses 12 to 17. This says, Jesus brings light to darkness, which includes exposing sin and calling for repentance. Remember that in chapter 3 it began with, with John the Baptist ministry saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jesus came and was baptized by him. And now we see that this begins in verse 12. Jesus heard that John had been put in prison. And so that would have meant something to him. Uh, he loved John the Baptist. They were relatives. And, and you know we might read that and go well you know if this was some sort of a modern day movie it would have been a lot cooler if he had just went and busted him out you know and saved him but he didn't he he knew what his focus was he knew what his calling was and, and even though he loved and cared about John the Baptist he, and he never lost sight of what God had put him to do which was to seek and to save that which was lost and so Jesus hears about that no doubt had compassion on John and prayed to his father about him but it didn't stop him from going where he needed to go he departed he went of all places to Galilee and we see this uh, prophecy fulfilled from Isaiah 9 verses 1 and 2 that prophesied there that's shared with us in verses 15 and 16 that's that's a quote from Isaiah 9 1 and 2 about how he would go to Galilee and it says in verse 15 it called him Galilee of the Gentiles taking the message to the lost. And it talks about them, the, the Gentiles, that the people who sat in darkness would see this great light. That upon those who sat there in the shadow of death, they were on their way to hell. They were on their way to eternal separation from God. Now the light has dawned. The light has come. So what message does he have? Is it some little soft message? No. He tells them right away that you're sinners. That you need to repent. Repent 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's exactly the same thing that we saw in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2. John the Baptist saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's saying, the time is near. The end is near. What is your responsibility? To repent. To confess sins. To no longer live in darkness. To see the way of truth that we have today through the word of God. But back then, they didn't, they didn't have that blessing of having printed Bibles and everything. So they had to go and tell, and they had to hear that, that message of salvation. So Jesus is the one that brings that light, and He has called every believer to do the same thing. He has called us to share that with other people. How is our church going to grow? It's going to grow by you telling your friends about Jesus. It's going to grow by you inviting people to church. It's, um, that's the only way that it will happen. You know, most people in Laplace are not in a house of worship last night, today, or tonight. They just won't be. And sometimes people say, well, you know, we're in a, we're in a, a Catholic parish. The statistics say that we're 92% Catholic. But do you think that 92% of Laplace are in Catholic churches today? Not even close. Most of Laplace is not in any church today or yesterday or at any time during the week. And so that's where our witness needs to be vocal. We not, we not only need to lead through a lifestyle of, of a Christian lifestyle, but also with our mouth. Uh, talking to people, having conversations with people. That involves having relationships and friendships with lost people, doesn't it? Not just uh, creating a world where we don't know anybody that's not saved. We should know people that are not saved and to be able to form those relationships. We'll move on from there in verse, verse 18. It takes a little bit of a turn here. Um, he says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. There's so much in these, these short verses that we can apply to our lives. In your bulletin, you'll see the point there that the call of Jesus on our lives requires an immediate and bold response on our part. And we might read this and go, well, you know, I have a lot of questions. I mean... If somebody just yells out to you to follow me, this doesn't sound realistic. I mean, I'm going to have some questions like, who are you? What am I supposed to be doing? So we might read this and go, you know, that just sounds a little unrealistic. And there is some background that I think helps us a lot with this. And that's something that when Jesus in verse 18 called Simon Peter uh, and Andrew they already knew who he was. But he was calling for a decision to follow. Back in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 41, Peter and Andrew had already met Jesus. At an earlier date, in John 1, 35 to 41, it says again, the next day, John, talking about John the Baptist, so this is before this took place, John the Baptist stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he, John the Baptist, said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? Now remember, John the Baptist hadn't been developing disciples for himself, just like we as uh, you know, me as a pastor, I'm not to be developing disciples of me. I'm supposed to be helping you follow Jesus. That's what John the Baptist did. That's what his whole life was, was, hey, this isn't about me. This is about Jesus. Follow him. 
So they had already been hearing about Jesus. And now their, their teacher, John the Baptist, says, That's him. This is the man that I have been teaching you about. So Jesus says, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. So it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. They spent the rest of that day with Jesus, the one that they had heard about from John the Baptist. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. So do you see what's already happened here in the way of discipleship? John the Baptist accepted a call to the preaching ministry to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. And he taught and he tried to educate others to be on the lookout for the Messiah whose name is Jesus. So that when they saw him, they recognized him and they loved him and they wanted to learn from him. And we also see that it said that one of the two that day that saw, that saw him was um, Andrew. And then it told us that, you know, when this happened, who's the first person he went and told? Went and told his brother. And so that's that evangelism, that's that sharing, that's that going to people that we love and saying, hey, I want to tell you what I know about Jesus because I want you to know him too. And so they had already had this experience where God's already working in their lives. They're already hearing. They're already learning. And so now in this passage that we're in, Jesus is walking by the sea. And he sees Simon, Peter, and Andrew. They're doing what they do. They are fishermen. But God had other plans for them. And he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They knew who was speaking to them. They knew that he was call, calling them to leave what they were doing. To no longer trust in that fisher, fishing vocation for their, for their rent money and, and for their food money and all that. But to instead follow Jesus. And immediately they left and they followed. And we have two disciples right there. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, and the boat was Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So similarly, don't know all the background of them and, and, and what they knew about Jesus, but they obviously knew who was calling him. Enough to leave. They did the same thing and that they left their vocation and their financial provision to trust in Jesus to follow him but it, it specifically said that they also left their father Jesus talks a lot about idolatry and about being first that that if we're going to follow him he has to be first it can't be our our relationship with him can't be second it can't be added to something else. It can't be, as long as it doesn't interfere with me making money, as long as it doesn't interfere with my schedule, as long as, uh, you know, I can do this first because I have these other commitments, but when I can fit Jesus in or, you know, when, when it doesn't inconvenience me in any way, I'll follow. No, he said, I want, I want to be first. Does God want us to love our family? Absolutely. It's one of the commandments. Honor your father and mother. It's the only commandment with a, with a promise that your days would be long. That your life could literally be extended on this earth because you honor your father and mother. So those, that submission to our parents is throughout the scripture. Yet at the same time, a lot of people have family pulls that are very strong. That, you know, if I do this, my... my Parents are not going to bless me. They're, they're not going to be proud of me. They, they might disown me. They might take me out of the will if they find out that I'm following Jesus. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, hey, 
if you're going to follow me, it's got to be all about him. And if you're a parent, your best buddy, uh, a family member, your government, whoever it might be, says, we don't agree with that. You can't do that. Giving us a choice to say, well, well, who's my master going to be? Am I going to follow Jesus just when it's easy or profitable? Or am I willing to follow, period, no matter what? Am I be willing to be excommunicated from my family because I obey? So that's what it comes down to. Why didn't he call Zebedee? Why didn't Zebedee be called? He was there in the boat. But he just called the two sons. This is where, first of all, we're never too old to be called, are we? I graduated seminary with, with a guy that went to seminary after he retired. His name was Bill. He was a great friend of mine during seminary. And it was through his personal recommendation that I ended up uh, pastoring a church for more than five years in the state of Florida because of Bill's reputation and, and he's the one that, that gave them my resume. He was called as a retired person and he planted a church in a retirement community in Florida, in, in the villages of Florida. He planted, I believe it's... I don't know, Village Baptist Church or something, but the village is a huge retirement community about an hour north of Orlando. So it's never too late. But we can see some tendencies in the scripture. And the tendencies were that Jesus called people when they were young, and a word we use might, might be unattached. You know, they didn't have family, they, they weren't consumed with the weight of the world on their shoulders yet. They were able to do what they wanted. They were still able to decide, hey, what am I going to do with my life? And so that's something that people are, that are still young, that are in, we have some, some teenagers here, some high schoolers. God may call you to do something. You don't have debt. You don't have all these promises that, that have to be fulfilled. You can do whatever you want to do. Period. Whatever God calls you to do. And that is true of all of us. But as you get other commitments, then it becomes harder to let go, doesn't it? It becomes easier to make excuses. Well, I can't do that right now because I've got this responsibility. I can't do this now because I have debt. I've got a mortgage. I've got whatever. And I can't just walk away from those. They were at a point where they could literally drop what they were doing and walk away. They could quit their job and walk away. And that's another reason for caring for your finances. So that, you know, the Bible tells us that the borrower is servant to the lender. That you are a slave to a master when you go into debt. And it makes it very difficult when God calls you to do something. It makes it more difficult to say, I can literally walk away and go do this. But it does involve a commitment. So even though we may say, well, you know, it's, it's a process. Um, I had to hear the gospel. I had to understand some things. The bottom line is, it does involve a moment of commitment. It's like some people, they say, oh, I never buy a car when I go to the dealership. I always go home and pray about it. Well, you're driving a car, so you obviously bought one at some point. You made a decision. You may have not made it that first time, but you made it, or you'd still be walking, right? Or having the swim. So with Jesus, it's like, well, we can say, well, I need to hear more. I, I need to understand more. I, well, there is a time that he calls us to make a decision. That first thing is salvation, right? The most important decision we ever make. Not just, you know, coming to church, hearing this, hearing that, maybe have another Bible study, maybe read another devote. No, he wants to know, are you going to follow? Are you in or, or not? Is Jesus going to be Lord or not? And it involves a, a decision, and that's not to be put off. And then, now we're getting into more of, well, now that I'm saved, what am I supposed to be doing? Because the answer is obviously not nothing, 
right? God didn't call us to do nothing. He called us to do something. So even though he may not have called you to be a missionary or a pastor or a teacher or a youth minister or, or a music minister or a children's minister or whatever, he called you to be a believer that would impact other people through your life by being around people, by having an impact on other people. And so that involves us making a decisive a t decision. I am I going to be all in? The other thing that I would just encourage us in. Sometimes we're made uncomfortable by people who we might think are more obedient to Jesus than we are. And we may try to make excuses or try to discourage them in following. For example, you might, you might bring your children up in church to love Jesus and love the Lord and, hey, follow Jesus. We want you to be a, good, a person of good Christian character as an adult. But what are you going to do if your plans, whether you realize you have them in your head, your plans for your own kids are that they grow up, get married, have you some grandkids, live close by, make enough money so they don't ask you for any, and carry on. But what happens when your kid shows up one day and says, God has called me to the ministry and I'm moving away. Whoa, slow down. You don't know about the world. It's hard out there. Let me tell you why that's a bad idea. Do you know how much you have to make every month to pay rent? You can't follow Jesus now. You don't know enough. You're not educated enough. You don't make enough money. Why don't you slow down a little bit? Wait till you're 10 years older and then see if you're... Oh, you just talk, talking them out of being faithful to God? Telling them to do what we did instead of what we told them we wanted them to do? Playing it safe? Having this uh, stereotypical American dream attached to someone else? Instead of saying, you know, let's talk about that. I, I fully agree that we should make sure they weren't manipulated by someone. Because there's a lot of manipulation out there trying to get people talked into doing stuff or whatever that, that may be a whim or whatever. But when we know somebody, we know they know and love Jesus and that they are following Scripture and that they're doing what God has called them to do, we should encourage them in that. We should encourage them in their, their dream and their obedience to God. After he gets his four disciples there to begin... And he's making an impact. He's not losing focus because John's in prison. He's uh, preaching and, and teaching the lost and these, the Gentiles. And he's calling disciples and investing his life in them. We see in the last verses there that his ministry addressed spiritual needs through teaching and preaching. And physical needs through healing. It says, and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Like Jesus, we are to care about people's spiritual needs and physical needs, right? The passage in Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 40, that talks about uh, visiting the sick, feeding the hungry, visiting people in prison. And he says, you know, when you do this for other people, you do it for me. And he talks about how that's a, a sign that, that we're his. But there's several reasons that Jesus took time to heal people. One is that he could. I mean, he's God. He has the power to do that. 
And He still does. How many times have we prayed and God answers that prayer? But we don't really stop to think, God, I prayed for that and you did that. You healed me. You healed the person I prayed for. Praise God. It's just it's not as directly visual as it was then where we actually get to see him do it. You know, touch somebody and say that you're healed. That's amazing. But God is still healing. But he's loving. And he's compassionate. And he sees the, the great need. We also have to remember that sickness was attributed to two things. One of the things that we don't really attribute it uh, much today, um, but one of the things that was in their culture was that sometimes they attributed somebody being sick as a direct consequence of sin. So sometimes people would say, well, so and so sick, uh, they must have done something. You know, this was a real thing that sometimes people that were sick were, were judged that saying, well, God's all obviously judging them, that's why they're sick. But even when it wasn't from that, we would today agree in the scripture that sickness is a result of our fallen world. You know, that before Adam and Eve sinned, we didn't have sickness, but since Genesis 3, we, we have sickness. And so even though we wouldn't say, well, so-and-so's sick because they sinned, we would say, well, we have to deal with cancer, we have to deal with sickness, we have to deal with all of this stuff in this world because we are a lost and fallen world. So think about that. When Jesus could go up to someone then that was sick, when he would heal them, and many people that were watching attributed their sickness to their personal sin, they would have seen a visual representation, this man can forgive sins. This man can make it like that sin never happened. And then when we attribute it to just in general, sin being in the world, and Jesus can heal sickness then, we'd say, look at eternity. There's going to be no sickness in heaven. There's going to be, we're all going to be healthy in heaven. We're going to have new bodies. And so it's kind of a, it added to and symbolized and illustrated for them the message that he was speaking about repenting of sin, about receiving forgiveness, about having a new life. In Christ. And they say, wow, this person has been made well again. Physically. Outwardly. And when we get saved, Jesus does that inwardly. Cleans us from our sin. So I would encourage you today to ask yourself a very basic question. Am I following Jesus? If you're here today and you've never made a decision to be saved, don't put that off. If you believe in Jesus, be saved today. We're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to say a prayer. Miss Jennifer is going to come up and lead us in a song. That is our invitation. We're inviting you to respond to the Word of God. Brother Brandon's going to be down here. I'm going to be here. Come say to us, hey, I want to pray today to be saved. But if you're already saved... You may have something else to pray about. God, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? Am I building up the kingdom or am I tearing it down? Am I building up the health of my local church body or am I tearing it down? Am I doing anything at all? Am I actively being negative or am I just being disobedient by being passive? God, what would you have me to do in my life, in my workplace, with my neighbors, with the people that you put in my life? How could I impact them? If I was in Jesus' shoes, when I found out, you know, I had just been put through this temptation, been attacked by the devil right after I got baptized, what I've spent the rest of my life pouting, and asking to share my story at churches about how I had been persecuted and I was a martyr for the faith because I had to go through these difficult times or what I pouted and said, God, why would you allow my friend John the Baptist to be put in prison? That's not fair. Would I have allowed these challenging circumstances to distract me? Or would, like Jesus, I, I keep my eye on the goal? God has called me to seek and to save that which was lost 
And that's where my focus is going to be. That's where my focus is as a pastor. We want to worship Jesus. We want you to grow in your faith through the, the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. We had a wonderful Sunday school lesson today about the value of human life. And, and it was just awesome out of the book of Acts and Psalms. We want when you leave here to go, wow, I was encouraged by the Word of God. I'm, I've been renewed and encouraged and, and challenged that I need to step it up. We're going to be taking the Lord's Supper one week from today in this very room. The Bible says we need to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. That we need to have a time of self-examination. That doesn't need to start during the sermon next week. A few moments before we partake of the Lord's Supper. We need to already be doing that. We need to already be doing that. God, am I following you? Where am I being disobedient to you in my life? Self-examining. Self-accountability. Standing before God. God, point out the things in my life that need to change. And give me the boldness to do it. To be a different person now. To be a better person. To be more like you. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge that's been issued. God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for giving every single one of us a chance to be saved. God, I pray that no one here would leave today without getting right with you, without confessing of their sins and repenting and asking to be saved, Lord. We pray, Lord, for those that are saved and are trying to discern, God, what are you calling me to do to follow? How am I to follow you specifically? What would that look like for me? God, I pray that you clarify that in people's hearts and minds and where it's already clarified to get the focus to do it. God, we pray for our church body. God, that you'd heal uh, damages, Lord, that you'd heal uh, situations that aren't healthy. God, that you put an end uh, to gossip and strife. And God, that we have be unified and have the same heart and mind to love you, to love each other, and to serve you, and to be inviting our friends to join us in, in worship. Lord God, we come before you today thanking you, Lord, praising you for your love for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name.